ground in Kenilworth Parkside in the far northeast Washington, D.C. That was one of the most dangerous areas of the city of Washington. Um, there were an uh, average of a death every two weeks out mm. there. But when the residents took over the management of it, all the maintenance personnel were residents. They had drug sweeps. They cooperated with the police. They started their own daycare centers uh, mm -hmm. and began to start their own businesses. As a consequence, uh, last week we found that the police report there hasn't been a, drug, a death in four years. Oh, really? Uh, 680 kids from this one public housing development have now gone on to college in the past seven or eight years. Welcome to Worth Quoting, sponsored by the Open Campus at Florida Community College at Jacksonville. I'm Afesha Adams, Dean of the College of Arts and Science at the University of North Florida. I'm host for this week's program uh, because of my association with a study that the uh, Jacksonville Community Council Incorporated is doing. And I have the opportunity to introduce to you Mr. Robert Woodson president of the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise in Washington, D.C. Mr. Woodson, it's nice to welcome you here. Pleased to be here. Uh, I'm very anxious for you to share your uh, program with the uh, people, with our audience this evening. One of the things that interested me most was your motto. And your motto is turning problems into opportunities. Will you tell us how, uh, about the program and yes. how you do that? I founded the, Na the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise 11 years ago. It is a national nonprofit uh, headquartered in Washington, D.C. And we assist low-income groups around the nation achieve greater self-sufficiency uh, through empowerment strategies. By that, we mean that we go into neighborhoods experiencing uh, problems Mm -hmm. identify uh, the people in those neighborhoods who are managing to help overcome teen pregnancy, start small businesses, uh, the people who are educating children successfully, and then we document their success and then uh, attempt to provide them with resources to expand their influence, and then we determine what are the implications of public policy. So, uh, and then we write books, we do um, television shows, we act as their public affairs directors and get them on national television. And uh, so we just trying to challenge the old uh, traditional approaches to uh, remedying poverty in the country. Well, let's start at the beginning with all that. How is it that you go about identifying these people? How do you, how do you find, and how do you get these people to be willing to talk to you? Uh, frequently, we hear that people in uh, low-income communities are very suspicious of outsiders that come in asking them questions. How do you uh, begin to make the contact? Well, most of my professional career since the mid-60s when I was active in the civil rights movement, I have had linkages to grassroots groups. I'm a dropout from the civil rights movement in oh, the I late see. 60s when I found that a lot of the poor blacks who are suffering and sacrificing most on the picket lines were not benefiting from the change because when the racial barriers were lowered, many blacks who are well-educated, who came from solid families, were able to walk through and take advantage of the jobs and others that were opening up. But a lot of poor blacks did not have the means to stay in the hotels or move in the neighborhoods because their problems were economic. And I felt that the civil rights movement had little appreciation for those barriers. So I've been devoting all of my life to working on, among and on behalf of low-income people so I've got a, uh, a reputation that extends over 25 years. And so I, uh, people know about us through word of mouth. I have worked with groups over the years. So these sort of networks have formed. And I do a lot of television talk shows. And I read the newspapers and seek out uh, uh, people uh, who are achieving against the odds in these communities. And then I call them, and they know about us. And, and, and we do teleconferencing that links uh, 30 cities Mm -hmm. so that we, we, we 
concentrate on advertising what we do and how we do it and people just sort of come to us as a consequence. Uh, I think I was reading something about um, your um, uh, program and uh, you sometimes send people into laundromats to uh, begin conversations with people? Yeah, what uh, my colleague John McKnight at Northwestern, sort of one of my, my, my peers, he sort of piloted a uh, capacity inventory. He called it the um, dryer test. Mm -hmm. We go into low-income communities, and if someone drops their clothes in the dryer uh, to, to dry them, he said, I'd like to interview you about what you do, what strengths you have. And people are flattered. Low-income people are so accustomed to researchers and others coming and asking about how many children they have on, on drugs, how many in jail, that, that very few people ever come into these communities and inquire of people whose children are not dropping out of school or on drugs mm -hmm. or committing crimes to find out how they were able to achieve against the odds so that we build a lot of uh, information based upon success stories that we find in these communities. And so our program is based upon um, these success stories and finding out from people what works and why. I see. Well, can you tell us about some of the initiatives that you've yeah. been involved with? I think the area where we've gained most of our reputations in public housing, there are about 3 million people living in 1.3 million public housing units. And as you know and your viewers know, uh, those are usually the areas of high crime and whatnot. Well, we went into these developments about seven years ago mm -hmm. and identified five around the country where the residents had taken over the management of them. Mm -hmm. and they began to successfully drive out the drug dealers, uh, motivate their people to get off welfare, establish small businesses. So we brought them into a consortium. Mm, we see. started about seven years ago with just five of them. We met in a hotel room. We were supposed to meet for two hours, and we met for five hours without breaking for dinner mm. because they had so much to exchange. And then from there, we sent television cameras into the communities to document their success. And then we put them on a satellite teleconference and studios. Other public housing residents were invited to listen. And from there, it has now blossomed to our convention in Boston. We had 1,700 people. Oh, really? And oh, really? over 200 developments are now in the process of receiving training about how do you take over, how do you form a board, how do you manage your books, how do you set up daycare centers using what are the rules that you apply? What are your strategies for setting up laundromats? Uh, how do you set up businesses? When you help low-income people redefine themselves from society's victim, mm -hmm. that are the constant recipients of social programs to providers of service to themselves, and, and when they move from consumer to producer, it is amazing the unleashing of creativity and innovation that occurs that merely has to be harnessed. Mm -hmm. And so what the National Center does is recruits corporations, foundations to provide support directly to these grassroots groups that enables them to strengthen what they do. We encourage corporations to loan us executives and mm -hmm. others who can, uh, in the words of uh, one policymaker, we need professional outsiders who are willing to be on tap but not on top. I see. I see. That's an interesting phrasing. Uh, uh, how is it that the corporations are willing to invest their resources in these kind of projects? How is it that they're willing to provide that funding? Well, many of the corporations and, and some of the United Ways and foundations around the company realize, country realizes that over the past 25 years that they have been just pouring money into uh, uh, strategies uh, to help poor people and they're not seeing any benefit mm -hmm. from these and so they're looking for alternatives. Also corporations realize that the workforce of the future will be increasingly drawn from black, Hispanic and, and women's mm -hmm. groups mm -hmm. and since those communities are in, in decline they must now roll up their sleeves and play an active role in reducing poverty if they are to be uh, competitive in the future. So there is a proprietary interest that I think neighborhood people and businesses share in common now mm -hmm. uh, that needs to be harnessed. And the role of the National Center is to act as an honest broker that brings the resources and the needs of these two groups together. I see. Well, now, can you tell me uh, about some of the problems that you've seen reduced in these kinds of environments? Has have 
school attendance increase? Oh, yeah. Is the teenage pregnancy reduced? What, what outcomes have let's, there been? Let's take one, and that's an exemplary of what's going on in Kenilworth Parkside in far northeast Washington, D.C. That was one of the most dangerous areas of the city of Washington. Um, there were an uh, average of a death every two weeks out mm. there. But when the residents took over the management of it, all the maintenance personnel were residents. They had drug sweeps. They cooperated with the police. They started their own daycare centers uh, mm -hmm. and began to start their own businesses. As a consequence, uh, last week we found that the police report there hasn't been a, drug, a death in four years. Oh, really? Uh, 680 kids from this one public housing development have now gone on to college in the past seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. uh, teen pregnancies have about been eliminated. Uh, welfare dependencies down from 85% to 20%. And they celebrate every time someone gets off welfare and gets a job either in the businesses in the neighborhood or in the local economy or the regional economy. Now, tell me, tell me something about these businesses in the, in the neighborhood because one of the things that we hear a lot about is uh, the impact of the recession and how difficult it is to find jobs. And so here you have people who very well may not be very well prepared for uh, lots of variety of jobs, and yet they're finding work. How has that happened? Because we always think of poor people, again, as, as, as someone needing jobs. We don't think of them as creating jobs. Oh, well, that's 80 percent of all jobs in the American economy are not generated by IBM or big corporations moving in. They're generated by small firms. And so therefore, um, what we try to do is give them the wherewithal to create wealth. In other words, the public housing development, often people have to travel four or five miles just to get their hair cut mm -hmm. or buy groceries. Mm -hmm. And yet, there's, there's the money there, whether the money comes from welfare or whatever, legal or illegally, people still have to, are spending. Yes. And so what we do is help them to identify what are those critical needs mm -hmm. and then help them do the business plans, help them with the capital, and help them with the training necessary to establish these businesses and because they have made the community safe, it means that they have a competitive advantage over other commercial strips that are not as safe. And now they're even talking about building a mini mall inside of the public housing development. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah. and you can do all these things within public housing? Yes, you can. Uh, the, the difference, yeah, you can. There's an awful lot that you can do that people never think about doing. In this case, it is, uh, we have transfer the ownership of this public housing multifamily unit to the residents. Oh. Yes, that's one of the first in the country where now the residents, corporation, and the individuals own the property. And we have, uh, uh, have initiated training and other developments around the country. But uh, there's nothing in the public housing law that says you can't start a business and operate a business in there. I see. I see. Are there some other programs that your uh, center has been involved with? Yes, uh, we have helped with a lot of um, uh, independent neighborhood schools where there are about uh, 350 independent neighborhood schools. 80% are in the black community uh, teaching children that the public schools have given up on. Mm. Uh, some of these kids are uh, operating uh, two years above grade level. Uh, they have, and so we support these independent schools uh, Public schools are educating them at in Newark, for instance, at a cost of $10,000 per capita. Our independent school, uh, the Chad School in Newark, educates those kids at $3,000 with a zero dropout rate. Is and some public school teachers even quit higher paying public school jobs to come and work in these independent schools just for the opportunity to teach and to be free of the kind of bureaucracy that uh, prevents them from exercising their creativity. Okay, now let me make sure I understand how, you, how your center works. So you, the first thing you do is to identify initiatives and programs that are already working. underway, yes. Okay, and then you work with those people yes, to we, enhance what they're doing? Absolutely. Enhance what they do and then uh, help them to document what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, we act as their scribes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We do policy tracks. We come and videotape them to help them to market themselves. So let's say that if there are 10 other communities that want to establish their own independent schools, we will bring five of the leaders of the existing independent schools yes. 
bring them together with the people who are interested in starting schools, uh, people in public housing who are interested in running their own development. Mm -hmm. We bring them together with the people who already have the experience. So we act as an honest broker I between see. what exists and, and, and the people are interested in creating alternatives. So we act as the broker. I see. Now, you have mentioned earlier that when you leave from here, uh, you're going to um, Tampa to work with uh, two different groups of ministers? Yes, we uh -huh. are um, one of the great unutilized resources in our community, the black community, is the black church. Mm -hmm. According mm -hmm. to surveys that we have done, 62% of all black surveys look to the church for leadership. Uh -huh. Uh, we have found that some of those churches have expanded the definition of their role beyond just the spiritual, but also setting up businesses in those communities. The 12th Street Baptist Church in Detroit has taken over 53 abandoned houses, purchased them with church money mm -hmm. that were being used by crack dealers, renovated them using members of the congregation, and then moved members into them, moving them from renters to owners. Yes. And now they've established their own restaurant. In the first year, it does $600,000 volume. And so uh, Reverend Lee Earl is coming with 25 other black pastors that have large churches to share his experience and experiences of others so that we can perhaps uh, do with the churches what we're doing with public housing. Mm -hmm. Again, mm -hmm. acting as a broker, taking what works, spreading it uh, nationwide so that they can establish a network of economic-based uh, programs and churches. Um, one, as I listen to you, I'm reminded um, a, a lot of um, a movement, uh, I, I don't know, 20 years ago, um, very much a nationalistic movement. And uh, can you talk about that? Do you see some similarities between what you're doing and what the people who were really identified as, as separatists uh, <laughs> talked about? And um, did, did did any of their work influence you in the things that you're yeah, doing? Yeah, people don't realize, but the, um, the black community's progress has been served by thoughtful debate inside. We often get portrayed as a monolith, mm -hmm. that uh, all of us tend to be liberal Democrats who believe in expansion of the welfare state and, and a measure of a compassionate society is how much we spend on welfare. Well, some of us reject that. Some I of see. us have always rejected it historically mm -hmm. from uh, 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 um, Marcus Garvey. I'm a Garveyite. I see. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Marcus Garvey was a black man in the 20s who believed that black America must take charge of itself and not always appeal to the guilt or largesse of the larger white society. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think a lot of his views are misrepresented. But Garvey was challenged by the pro-integrationist leaders of the time. In fact, actually drummed out of the country and imprisoned as a consequence of the, 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 his challenge. And later, um, Fuller Brush, uh, S.B. Fuller, people don't realize, but the Fuller Brush Company was a black-owned company in the 60s that pioneered franchising. He also, in the 60s, was a strong advocate for establishing our own retail stores that could hire millions of our own people. Yes. He also was uh, castigated by the integrationist civil rights leaders uh, of that day, and almost uh, there was a national boycott organized against him. Uh, uh, against but, Fuller. Against Fuller for his advocacy of self-help in what I may see. be considered nationalist. Uh, so I guess I am in that tradition. <laughs> yes. That I advocate, and it's not a separatist uh, uh, agenda. It really is uh, a pluralistic agenda. Okay. That America is not a melting pot, it is a salad bowl. Yes. We have Jewish universities, Catholic universities, but we also, Catholics go to other universities. I believe that each group must have its own institutions, but free and open to everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, the black community is, uh, that we made a fundamental mistake by failing to understand the difference between desegregation and integration. I fought and went to jail in the Civil Rights Movement for desegregation. Yes. I did not fight for integration. That's an individual matter. And I don't think it's a business of public policy to be forcing people to integrate. 
Well, unfortunately, we don't have time to get into that topic further, but that, that's a critical issue, and it's a critical issue in education in American society today. So you must get involved in lots of controversy over, over this topic. Yeah, controversy not by the, the people in, who are suffering in those neighborhoods whose children aren't. Uh, the largest abandonment of public schools is not occurring by poor people. It's public school teachers. Oh, I see. In How areas, well, if you look at the data, in the larger, uh, first of all, public school teachers as a group send their children to private schools in twice the number of the general population. Mm -hmm. And your major urban areas where education is the poorest, public school teacher abandonment is the highest. Chicago, 57% of Chicago's public school teachers send their kids to private school. 61% in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, on surveyed, said they would never send their children to the schools where they teach. Mm. <laughs> but, no, but no one says, well, this is uh, creaming or abandonment of those schools. So if the public school teachers who teach there won't send their children there, then why would we wonder why low-income parents want an option yes. to public schools? I see. I so see. these are the kind of uh, challenges that we're trying to make to at least to get all of us thinking and discussing these issues without being fear of being labeled. Because often when you say the things that I say, yes. people try to label you and therefore dismiss what you say. Mm -hmm. But we think that uh, the interests of black America, the interests of all America is served if there is more thoughtful and open debate where we can disagree without being disagreeable. And there are so few forums where this is taking place that we are not really coming up with new solutions as a consequence. Uh, before our time is up, I do want to uh, uh, ask you to comment on um, uh, what you see as the concerns and issues facing upper and middle income African Americans. I know that your focus and the focus of your organization is on low income people, but uh, do you think all the problems are, are, uh, have been overcome? for this, these other groups and they're home free now? No, I don't think the problems have overcome, but you see, I think we've got to establish priorities. Mm -hmm. And a priority for me is not Bob Woodson and his children, but the priorities are for low income people. But I would say the, the challenges facing upper and middle income blacks is that too many of us are clustered in government and in, the, in, 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 in government. In other words, only one out of six whites with a high school, with college education works for government. Three out of six blacks with a college education works for government. Now, is that a hangover from the days when, when blacks could only get jobs in the post office, when all of those educated black people were working in, in the postal service because those were the only opportunities, real opportunities? That may be part of it, but uh, the, if you look at the amount of business formation, a lot of blacks are leaving family businesses in the South mm -hmm. and coming to schools and taking jobs in government uh, or taking jobs, uh, in, uh, taking jobs in corporations. Uh, some of those blacks in the South in particular, like Durham, that was once the economic black mecca. We used to call it the Black Wall Street. Oh, really? Yes, in Durham. Durham, North Carolina has one of the, the, the richest history of any place I know. And what happened is that some of these uh, younger blacks are now realizing that they have reached the ceiling in corporate America mm -hmm. and in government, mm -hmm. where you get a 3% increment a year for the next 25 years. Mm -hmm. They're leaving those jobs and going back into family-owned businesses and making and doubling their income. And I really think the resurgence, uh, the renaissance is going to occur in the South. Oh, do you For, think so? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, blacks in the South, in Durham right now, are, are owning industrial parks. They're putting up houses, building shopping centers. There's a resurgence of entrepreneurial activity occurring in the South uh, among entrepreneurs uh, when they realize that um, that the that the any group's participation in the American economy depends upon the amount of capital assets they have, not their good government job. If I die, I cannot leave my job to my child, mm -hmm. no matter how good it is. Mm -hmm. But you can leave businesses, you can leave property. Yes. And yes. so it is wealth that we must be creating. So I think that to the extent that middle and upper income blacks take advantage of companies downsizing to go out and start their own businesses, mm -hmm. to leave government, 
and, and start to think about getting into their own business to the extent that there is a, um, a move in that direction, then we will uh, uh, respond favorably to the, for the future. But for us to just resist downsizing of government and be in opposition to every major reform mm -hmm. instead of trying to embrace reform to say that if this is the trend, then what are the implications for us? For instance, t the telephone companies are beginning to get into the tele uh, teleconferencing business, yes. which is going to have an effect on cable television. Well, then we need to analyze that to talk about how can we strategically position ourselves so when this change occurs, we benefit. But this is seldom on the agenda of uh, many black organizations. They don't discuss things like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and so is that one of the directions that you will be taking in the future, is bringing groups together to look at those kind of uh, entrepreneurial yeah, opportunities? To the extent that I'm asked to, because uh, my priority is still low-income people, but I do look at trends. But for instance, we sponsored some conferences in the 60s to look at the implications for, e for economic implications of cable television. Yes. Because I said cable is going to be big one day. Mm -hmm. So we had conferences. We got uh, some blacks owning cable license and things like this. Unfortunately, they, they thought the money was in the hardware and sold out. Oh, unfortunately. And, and they didn't understand what the routine was. It's also unfortunate that our time is up. It's been a real pleasure uh, spending this time with you. So thank you very much. And thank you for looking.